All right. So it's very working. Sorry. It's oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, hi. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I feel like I'm at the beginning of a weird kind of joke. Two librarians walking to a developers conference. Um, here's uh, who we are. And we have been as subject experts uh, involved in all the wonderful things that you've heard about in the previous talk. So the last year was really exciting. We got at least three new discoveries um, at our library and lots of new things. And as we all know, um, now they're here, they work, everybody's happy, and that's it. But no, wait a second. <gasps> Where's my stuff? And once we have the new search systems, all our new find instances, library based, the real question became again, well, actually, you know, features are great, but we're doing this so people can actually find stuff. And as we all know, once it's a default, and that's, and also the expectation of our users is they want relative uh, base ranking. I'm not going to talk today about the high topic of how we can improve balance in the base rankings in a you know far future by randomizing them and getting rid of the um, inherent biases which all relevancy ranking algorithms have. What I'm going to talk about is much simpler. So we have a catalog, and our users have trouble finding our stuff. So these are two examples. They're two recent examples. Note that somebody's looking for a piece by the author here. Um, and this is already the improved version, so that the first hits are by that author is something we rolled out based on our process, which we are not going to explain. But then, it, and I literally discovered this five days ago, suddenly hit number 60 is again by the author. Why is that down there? And the other one here, we have another instance. Uh, the user searches for Berlin history, um, and we have 9 million hits. Are they really relevant? No. And I'll get to that. So, what do we do about this? In order to have take a look at how we can manage this, we have to look a little bit at the context here. So we have the data side. Yes, sometimes we find data bugs. We fix it in the data. There's a lot of legacy data in there which we know of, and which we also know that really updating that and changing it has been proven too costly and time intensive in the past, and it's still is. Um, we have the discoveries, and we have many stakeholders. You've just heard the idea. You heard the previous talk about people um, who have opinions, needs, desires for how this would look. But the big advantage here is it's relatively easy to treat and fully under our control. And one additional problem, or no problem, or but case is the fact that we're using a collaborative index and the index configuration is not fully under our control. This has a lot of advantages, it also has disadvantages. One being quick fixes for them. Um, so, okay, we've identified where we can spend our efforts to increase uh, the quality of our search results. And let's say at the beginning of this process, and I'm going to talk a lot, and we both are going to talk a lot about the process inside the library. I'm not going to bore you with too much code, um, also the librarians. Um, but there were two questions, two, let's say two views or plans of how we could do this. Plan one was one employee by hand, just this manually. And <laughs> plan B was, okay, maybe we try to do something a little bit more team-based, maybe also assisted by computers. And that is where I basically picked, you know, picked them to the ones and said, wait a second, maybe we can you know, try to do this together. So what are our goals here? Our goals are end the folder madness. So one employee by themselves using folders to keep track of changes a configuration file, you know, what could possibly go wrong there. Um, make the process more transparent because we need the communication, both with the developers, subject experts, users, we need something um, where we work together. Um, document our strategy. Wouldn't it be nice if our users knew what we, what we as library expect from our ranking? Um, big point, in my view, avoid a loop of regressions. Yeah, so anybody, whoever asks last or screams loudest, that's that's the new principle of ranking. And then nobody knows that there were discussions before. Make side effects visible and actually improve our communication because that, I think, is the most crucial task here. It's a communication job, both between us and the users, but also between us and the developers and the developers and the user and everybody involved. 
and get away from this kind of feeling of this was better before or I don't like this or this is different into more concrete, reproducible samples. Okay, so what did you try? What would you like to see? How did you get there? That kind of stuff. Sounds very familiar with the software developers. Not, ne not necessarily, um, you know, that's the whole point. You're trying to say, you can do this also with non-developers. So based on these goals, I, we had a few ideas. We use the GUI whenever possible. And this is a big one. Um, it's not so much that the librarians need to become the JavaScript developers or have a perfect understanding of uh, the HTML zone or something, um, or become proficient in them. But with simple GUI tools, and these exist for free, they're there, like GitHub Desktop, made a huge difference in simplifying these procedures. And also, we decided to forgo a kind of um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the classes anymore, but there's a refined testing framework. Um, using a browser-based testing framework, much simpler. Picking in the browser, like you normally do, it helps you to, you know, do things in a normal way. Um, automate as much as possible, put it on GitHub, and from a test design perspective, simplicity beats performance. It's not fast. We could have made this much faster. This could run in 12 seconds. It takes three minutes. We, we, we could have applied an engineering perspective to the test suite, but that's not the point. The point is that people who are not engineers can work with this and use it. So simplicity always wins. Keep it simple. And here's some examples. This is a test. JavaScript is totally overrated. More than 80% of, if you're talking, we're talking about relevancy scores and relevancy testing. Yeah, it's not a unit test, it's not integration testing. More than 80% can be boiled down to these three questions. Is it in the hit list? Does it appear before the other thing? Or does it not exist in the hit list? Um, and is a certain string somewhere visible on the page? And this is an actual example with the link if you download the slides from one of the searches. You see here there's a Chinese search string, and we want there because we know our records. Um, I'm actually subject librarian for his data, so we, yeah, we want there to be an item which has the Latin transcript with any one code. And even as a non programmer, it's you really don't need to understand JavaScript to be told, hey, in look for, type your search, and then down there in contains, edit what you think should be there. And of course, there are problems, but again, 80%, you know, 20% of the efforts. Get the 80% done. The same goes for the wonderful search specs YAML. Most instances, what people need to do is maybe add a field that hasn't been indexed or they need to adjust the booze. You do not under, need to understand the scene syntax to be actually productive with this. Um, and lastly, similar things go for the go for the dome. Um, there's three things you as developers can do to help your staff to interact with this. That's noted them here. Noted them here, have a data ID that is visible when you load the uh, search result list, which is whatever your dominant ID scheme is, because that's easy to deal with. And keep these, keep the result list, and you see this here that there's the result list and the record list of the result list data. Having these two separate is really helpful when you're designing tests. So being able to just look at the titles or look at the icons below, really helpful. What have we learned after doing this? Um, again, biggest issue is product stuff. Um, being allowed to automate a browser on a non-programmer laptop was a big problem. Still is. Don't know why. Um, <laughs> what we have also learned in the kind of communication is not everybody likes to be likes their statements to be reproducible. So it is a change of let's say communication function. Any error that happens, the first rebase is a show flag. Yeah, so you, you have if you if you're going in this direction and you want to enable your subject experts to interact with the system as a developer, this is the kind of request they will have. The first time they hit the rebase, they're like, oh my god, what's happening? Um, but then again, it's very much new to me. That's what we'll talk about. Can we overcome this or not? We can tell you about it. Um, Translating translating feelings, meanings about this was better before into something that is an assertion. That takes a little bit of experience. 
So, and, but that really is the point at which you elevate the quality of the communication. Because you're no longer just taking it was better before, or I like this better, but no, how, why, where? Um, and then once you get going, progress, progress is good. So once you overcome these initial hurdles, and they're not your standard hurdles, I would say, um, and managing expectations so they're good enough um, is a thing, can also be hard. There is no perfect ranking. There will never be a perfect ranking. And of course, both the data and everything changes in people in development. So if you've never done CICD, if you've never been in an iterative environment, getting into that mindset that it's a constant piece of work and it's iterative, um, and it's just trying to avoid regression, which takes some time to get used to. And please, if you're looking for an authorial pseudonym, or if you're naming children, have a second, second thought about using dictionary words as part of the name, because that's, um, yeah, that's the thing. And then the big, big one is really this com uh, combination. Like, you cannot rely on just user submitted queries or user reports about. I, I mean, in the best case, it's I typed this and expected this, but I got that. They don't know your collection. <laughs> they don't know if that request is reasonable, and they don't have the background knowledge of it might be a data problem that you're already aware of, and so on. So you really, there is no short circuit in this communicative circuit. And once you actually get the developers, the domain experts, and the users to talk together and to have this automated way of, or machine readable way of, of keeping track of your work in progress, um, I think it is it becomes a manageable problem, and that's this uh, basically the goal. So, um, starting from scratch, um, this is awesome because I don't have to do it alone. Alone meaning running eighty search queries manually and then look at all the results and gauge what has changed and. In how far has this changed? Is this better? Is this worse? What are the criteria and what are only side effects? Also, I can travel back and forth in time and all versions of YAML are safe. This might sound a bit uh, uh, ludicrous to you if you are a developer, but we really had no management of YAML uh, versions. We were thinking like, or I was thinking like, oh, I'll just um, save what I've done every time and put the date on it or something like that, which is, which we kind of realized would be a problem. So, and also I was very, really eager to, to enter the mysterious realm of uh, Git and kind of graduate to more developer-like uh, work processes and tools. So you might have come across this creative process with its uh, six stages, and this can be transferred 100% to the Git process. So we've been in the previous slide, and this is awesome. Now things get tricky. Um, the biggie really is, and if you have been working with Git for years and years, that's, this might be hard for you to understand, but for a newbie, Git is really difficult. I had real trouble to get my head around the workflow and this multiverse thing with all those branches. And I I was, and I have to say, I am getting lost time and again. And then reading the test results in Cyprus is all very well if they are green, but um, reading, interpret interpreting test results, uh, if they fail, not so easy. Um, another thing which uh, Duncan talked about a bit, and that this might be a bit repetitive, there seemed to be a culture clash. Um, to librarians, it seems to come naturally to do manual searches and interpret the hit lists. Um, this feels personal, intellectual. It seems more hands-on to us. It feels more controllable. It even feels more reproducible and traceable. It's what we are used to. To to hand this over to what feels like formalized tests and automated automated testing, and then looking at green checks and red crosses feels a bit like loss of control and kind of externalized. And it even seems 
to be technocratic and kind of out of our hands. Um, there's the issue of trusting the process and trusting the tests because the first instant reaction often is, oh, the result is not okay, the test must be wrong. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, no, tests are the formalized um, expression of the demands, how the ranking should look like. So, no, fiddling with the tests should be the last result. Um, yeah. So, my workflow as a librarian and a newbie to Git and Cypress is I use GitHub Desktop because that is the um, software that Stavi uses for it. No, but no, it's, it's the GUI. It's yeah. the GUI. No, no. You see, I'm getting confused again. So that's why I'm <laughs> confused. Um, and of course, do what you do with Git. You all know this. And then I open the YAML to the left and uh, change stuff, hoping it will get more tests green and load the new YAML to the test server and then run the tests and the end result with the browser-based testing, which is kind of the hinge of it all is this. Um, so to the right, I actually see what I would see if I did the search manually on the test server directly, but I also see what type, what the test did look for and if it found it or not. In this case, not. No, because the test is red. And I also can click on the URL and that would take me over to the test server where I can even, where I can access more hits, even if this test would say, look at only five or 10 hits. So this is the beauty of it. And this makes it very manageable for a librarian like me. Mm. Then of course, if I, if I found something that did work, I push it, I do a merge request. Um, I still have trouble with um, if there are, you have, stashes or cherry pick commits, it's still a bit difficult for me. So hit steep learning curve. If it feels natural to you, lucky you, I envy you. I, I'm still uh, feel like this sometimes. So so but moving on in the status of the creative or good process, um, this might be okay because it really helps um, managing um, expectation, what YAML can and can't do regarding the viewpoint result list because the, the YAML is not a jack, jack of all trades device. There are conflicting demands. For example, it's hard if you want to have chronology ranking from the newest to the latest but you also want to have the reviewed publication beneath the reviews. This is kind of tricky as is probably easy to see. So there's, there's a price, it comes as a price if you want A and B, chronological ranking and reviews down, what do you do? You have to prioritize what your demand is, what's more important. Because again, I repeat, there's no such thing as a perfect YAML. What we have to, and that might be hard for librarians um, because they tend to be a bit perfectionist. Um, there is no perfect ranking. We have to live and be happy with an okay ranking. So um, this is one of the beauties, which you all know if you are a programmer, developer, but I can actually see um, there are 19 passing tests and to the right down there are 23 passing tests. So something has improved. I Actually, the, the ranking has become better, has gotten better. So you might not be surprised that this slide is again, this is awesome. We've come full circle in the creative and Git process. This really is awesome because 
Um, apart from the things we already saw on the first slide, this is awesome. There are now new great things like we saw, I can track progress accurately. There is a clear definition of goal. If more tests are green, that's progress. If all tests are green, that is the goal that has been reached, that will be reached, hopefully. And the other thing, which is um, a win, is collaborative YAML work is now easy because of it. We wouldn't have known how to do it before. Still, there are some frontiers. Um, it makes stuff clear. Um, the decision is in main. This doesn't necessarily translate to library management structure. It doesn't necessarily mean this is what we want because it might not necessarily meet all the demands. See above. Um, it would be nice to integrate CICD practice into librarians' everyday work. It's not easy to be done because librarians are not used to it. Plus, where are the uh, use cases for that? Then, um, at the beginning, we had an Excel sheet with those 80 queries, which I would supposedly type in and then interpret. And this has now evolved hugely from an internal Excel tree to a worldwide publication. And transparency is scary or can be. Also, as it is on Git now, this um, discovery system users can become contributors and contributresses, which also is something new. And how to to tell which ranking list is better? What do I doubt? What do our users really need? So we did some um, user research based um, user res ah, user research in the hope to base the decision making on that. And teaser, there's a talk um, tomorrow at three p.m. about user based um, de development with discovery system for the environment. So, this was us, people to ask.